Actually, no, next we have a very outstanding young man who came, who's I, in many ways uh, I, a very high achiever in many areas. He, I, he was a youth ambassador to the G20 for the, for the UK, to their youth conference. So he was selected amongst all young people in, in the UK as the representative. He was also uh, the winner of the last millionaire in, I think it's uh, in a, f a few years ago in Cairo, uh, which is a BBC uh, reality show. He's also a, a fifth dan in martial arts. <laughs> and he's also um, a high award uh, winner, but also a notable person for promoting entrepreneurship amongst young people, and particularly young people who are disadvantaged. So he's worked with disadvantaged youth in a, uh, after co-founding something called the Safety Box, which I hope he'll explain, uh, in order to encourage disadvantaged youth to get into entrepreneurship and take responsibility. He's also been involved in, in renewable energy. So he's promoted renewable energy products in Africa, in Latin America, and the Caribbean. So with all this, he's got a lot to say. <laughs> Please welcome. Uh, Nathaniel Peet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, I didn't expect such a big um, <laughs> introduction. Um, but uh, yes, my name is Nathaniel Peet. Um, and I wasn't actually going to discuss and talk about the safety box um, because that's another initiative. We actually started that in the UK um, after the death of um, a young man by the name of Kyan Prince. And there was a lot of young people which are disenfranchised with the education. Um, and the system of programming, basically, um, which starved the creativity in youth. Um, for instance, you get a young person teaching them about mathematics. When they learn about maths, they only have... Don't look at the slide. <laughs> look at me just for a minute. When you, when you actually talk to a young person about mathematics, you pigeonhole their creativity. For instance, you have a baby and you get a, you get a piece of a paper and, and the baby will screw the piece of paper up and make something from that piece of paper. They will get a chair and make it look like a spaceship. They, could, they have so much creativity. And what you see systematic education has done is actually starved creativity. It's starved innovation. And essentially, that's exactly what has happened with aid. And I'll explain a little bit about that and talk about building a sustainable world. Um, so you have really, which has come about for the last probably 10 years, has been this new concept of social entrepreneurship and social enterprise, which essentially is profit for good. Many people see social enterprise as being non-for-profit. But the problem with non-for-profit is you're not able to have sustainable growth without profit. You're constantly dependent upon drip feed. You're constantly dependent upon grants. You're constantly dependent upon funding. Whereas social entrepreneurship builds a sustainability model whereby you're able to put something in which yields a profit which able, is able to go back in and do something. You've got charity which is really aid. And I don't know if anybody has read the book Dead Aid. Has anyone read Dead Aid before? Put your hands up if you've read Dead Aid. You see, Dead Aid talks about charity and the negative impact that charity has actually had in places like Africa, in India, in the, in, in the developing world. And, and, and so we have something which is known as humanitarian aid. We also have disaster aid, which I, I view as being very good because when there's a disaster that happens, great, fantastic, the world rises and it impacts the people. It, it sends out food, it sends out water, it sends out clothing, it sends out different things for those people. You have humanitarian and disaster aid, which is very good, but you have systematic, systematic aid, which is actually bad after a certain period. Why do I say that? I say it because if somebody is constantly given something, they become dependent upon the feed. And when you're dependent upon the feed, it stops your ability to want to get it yourself. 
And so you have many communities in Africa in particular um, that have been under this type of systematic dead aid which hasn't helped them to elevate into empowerment as we've heard through the other speakers. And so where you have systems that pump money directly into projects, dumping, let's say, solar lanterns in a region, whereby the people don't understand how solar is used properly and you haven't diffused the right type of information around solar and how it works and when it, the panel gets dirty, uh, it no longer works or functions the right way and the person doesn't know that they've got to actually clean the panel which is going to give them that power and therefore what happens is because that person who didn't have the basic knowledge that they've got to clean the panel diffuses that information to the other people saying that solar is no good. And so you have a system that you're fighting on the ground then to, to, to try to change the perception that solar is good. And so that's a big problem. And so I'm only going to talk from the perspective of movement. Only from the perspective of doing, not talk conversation. Not conversation, actually doing. Because it's about doing where we have real impact, correct? But disruptive impact. So my company is called GenX. That's Africa at night. Um, Africa has an electrical penetration of close to 18%, but when you look at Haiti, Haiti's only got 8%. You look at countries around the equator in the Caribbean, like Jamaica, which has 93%, which is dependent upon gas, fossil fuels, when they've got, for the whole year, sunshine. Whereas 93, that 93% of the population that, that ha actually has the electrical power do not have the money to actually pay for that power. So we need sustainability by providing renewable solutions. In many of the areas of Africa, some villages, for instance, let's take Malawi, for instance, which has an electrical uh, uh, ability of 1%. So 99% of the population in Malawi do not have electrical power. What does that mean in terms of sustainability? It means if they don't have power, they're not able to turn a laptop on, they're not able to have light in their house. It means when the children are walking 10 kilometers from their school back home, the sun sets when they get in at 6 o'clock because they're near the equator, which the sun goes down at 10 to 5, civil evening twilight at 5.40. They get in and they're around a table with a kerosene lamp that the families have to pull together so that five children can study with one lantern because of, the, because of the poverty. And so the problems are very, very deep. So what our model is actually addressing is gender inequality. We're trying to impact women. This is another shocking statistic, and I'm just going to take um, Africa, for instance. 80% um, of the population that are women have no more than primary school education. That's an unacceptable figure in this generation. And so what we've had is systematic, systematic aid, which hasn't actually improved that. And so the movement to sustainable change has to take upon a new model. It has to think differently about how we do it. So my company, GenX, is looking at gender equality. We're looking at rural electrification. In fact, I was at the C4All um, United Nations uh, EU summit last year where they've launched a new model which is called Electrify. Electrify is a really good thing because um, they found that when they were, grants, when they were actually giving funds to, to entrepreneurs to sell like, solar products and stuff like that, um, the people couldn't make money from it because it was actually a grant. So a grant's meant to be non-for-profit. So they had to think of a new model so that they could actually make it not a grant meaning that they will be able to make money. So look at it like a grant or a loan. I'm taking my wallet out of my pocket because it's slowing me down. We're looking at youth unemployment, entrepreneurship, because there's a number of young people that don't have, do not have work. I can't remember the figure off the top of my head. However, um, if you uh, look at our Twitter page, I'll make sure they get that out um, on social media for the statistic for youth unemployment internationally, which is very, very high. And I'm going to try and blast through this because I know the time's short. 
We're focused also on STEM education, which is science, technology, engineering, mathematics education. We're doing that in the UK um, and also doing it in rural areas um, overseas. So essentially, this is the type of thing that is happening around the world. Four billion people internationally don't have power. Traditional power options are becoming less practical for the modern generation. In our, in our cities, we suck so much electrical power, it's unbelievable. We suck it. We suck electrical power like nothing. Our phones run out. 700 million people in Africa owned a phone by the end of 2012. And it's going to rapidly increase. We're looking at expanding at about 35% per year. In rural districts of Africa, 80% of households use their phone regularly. And you see, the thing is, with using their phone regularly, in countries like Kenya, where they have M-Pesa, which is a mobile banking system, it's vital for rural farmers that they have power on their phones. So, it's a big problem. As I said before, it's unacceptable for young people to have these type of kerosene lanterns, which burn them and it falls over and the house burns down. How sustainable is that? It's not sustainable. So we have a solution. What we provide is things like solar lanterns that empower these rural communities, solar chargers, which can power mobile phone devices, which go out into rural communities, whereby a farmer needs that now, because it's how he gets sick, he can call the person. Charging surfaces, which are powered directly through solar, solar bags, and they use Nokia's, that's why we've got a Nokia in this video, <laughs> because um, smartphone technology hasn't penetrated too fast. And so we have genetics. And essentially, what we're trying to do is bring renewable energy. And we're doing it in several different ways. We formed a partnership with the government, and it has to be a strategic alignment. With the government, you have to align yourself with NGOs, you have to align yourself with charities. Keep going. Uh, we, you, you, can you can turn up, it's okay. Uh, I'm going to just speak over the, the president. Um, I'll let you watch it, in fact, and I'll talk about the catch-up after. That the price of electricity will soon reduce. This was during the launch of the 140 megawatt or can afford to thermal power plant in Naivasha. And indeed, many Kenyans will be waiting for their power bills at the end of the month to ascertain whether the dream of affordable power is a reality. But while those already with electricity connections rejoice about lower power bills, there are about 67% of Kenyans who are yet to be connected to the national grid. And with the cost of maintaining a generator becoming even higher due to high cost of fuel, many Kenyans are turning to alternative solutions such as solar power, especially for lighting. Genex Solar has taken up the challenge to help light up Kenyan homes even as they wait to be connected to the national grid in different parts of the country. Genex partnered with the Green in Kenya Initiative where they have run several projects in Mukuru, Masai Mara, Machakos, and Mombasa. The pilot project in Machakos provides Note that the engineers are women. that can be used for lighting yeah. as well as charging some electronic devices. Genex Solar CEO Nathaniel Pitt says, and I quote, We want to bring about real social impact. It is now time to empower women and young people to succeed. Gen X will not just meet the power needs of people, but will also train and develop technicians, provide jobs and opportunity. End of quote. Yes. Gen X is considering setting up a manufacturing facility in Kenya, which will deal with the assembly and installation of solar products. Ruth Mutegi, Business Defined. So that's just an example of what we're doing in Kenya. Um, and what we've done is, note that the balance of the co-foundership, my business partner is Nigeria and she is a woman. Um, so when you have balance, you're talking about balance on both sides of leadership and also on every level. So you're talking engineers, you're talking people that work in the office. This is the head office in Nairobi and we just opened a satellite office in Machakos. In, on the other side of the globe, in Jamaica, the problems are different. It's not with the amount of electricity, it's the cost of electricity and it's also youth unemployment. So what we're doing in Jamaica, as we're doing here in England, is this is one of our solar lanterns. And um, you see, what they learn how to do is how to make this. So essentially, I'll use this microphone. So essentially what you have 
is a solar product which a young person will learn how to build with the knowledge of basic electronics. So what does that mean in a rural, in a rural community, in a rural village that is 20 kilometers away? When Solar Raid, which is a great uh, initiative, um, puts out solar products on the ground, and it goes way off into a village, when the battery fails, because it will fail after maybe three years, it means that the person there can maintain that through the knowledge that they have had in building it. So this is a centre that's been built in Jamaica. In fact, we just got back from Jamaica where we train young people not in education and employment how to make and build these things from scratch. We've just launched a project in the UK to stimulate science and technology with our young people because it's not fair that Africa get it, gets it and Latin America gets it and everywhere else gets it. And our young people are disenfranchised with the curriculum. They don't even want to learn science. <laughs> don't get to do it as well. So we're doing that here in the United Kingdom also. Um, we're really seeking more partnerships to actually come on board, and this is about doing. So we have young people in the middle of rural uh, Africa. They go out to a rural area, and now a young person's empowered because the farmer needs some energy for their phones, and we know about charging stations. You know, where they've got portable power, where they can actually now take a solar charger to the farmer and say, please sir, uh, I'll charge you 20 shillings for 10 oh, minutes. Great. <laughs> and so, so you create, you create, you take the raw, you take the absolute raw energy of many of these young people. I've travelled all over the place. I've been to India. We're in India. They tap on the window and the, the, the big uh, entrepreneur giants that are making money off of these beggars. And the young people have so much innovation, they tap their mouth. Like they want food and they're begging. But they have so much innovation, so much drive, no fear attitude. That's the mind of an entrepreneur. And you see, when you can create entrepreneurship and when you can attach the skill set and the no fear attitude directly into skill sets, you can birth something which is amazing. And this is about creating innovation. It's about creating gender equality. It's about helping people to rise. It's about empowering. The greatest significance we have in this life isn't found through how much money we make. It's not found through the house we live in. It's not found through, you know, what's in our wallet. The significance in this life is found through service. And in the last two minutes which I've got, um, I'm, I'm just going to say this to you. If anybody's very, very interested in systematic change, because governance is a huge hurdle, getting into Kenya, for instance, was, was very tough. And so we're actually partnered with um, the Africa um, Renewable Energy Summit. In fact, the head person is over here, just sitting down. We're going to be holding an event, in fact, on the 24th of uh, this, month, this month at the House of Commons to try to look at how we can change governance to allow for these things to develop. Uh, in those countries. So it's about an alignment, it's about a partnership. Let us aspire to inspire before we expire. Let's move forward.